Hi everybody, welcome to another edition of Bible Talk with Carolyn Billiard. I may need to make a disclaimer today that this program is not to discourage, dis, uh, disrespect, or promote anybody or anything. All I'm doing is talking about the Lord and God's Word out of the sheer pleasure of it. Thank you. Today, I had the hardest time with my hair. I'm not in the best of moods. But this doing this is something God has instructed me to do. And the devil has taught, done everything. Well, we won't say the devil. I don't want to scare people off when I say that. But the enemy has done everything in his power to stop me from doing it. And my hair wouldn't act right for nothing today. And I tried to try, but, you know, I got that kind of hair anyway. It's too thin to do anything with. So anyway, God bless my hair, and I have to go on. You know, I'm in the raw, I'm me, this is what I look like, and, you know, whatever. You know, I'm not glamorama. I don't have a makeup artist, I don't have a studio, I don't have a stage, I don't have lights, and, you know, I'm just me. You know, doing the best I can. So today, you guys, on I as you know, my format is to just call, is called winging it. I'm just going to open my Bible. And go to a place. And it's already open. And it was open when I was complaining about my hair or makeup or whatever. And then, you know, God had this already open for me. So, you know, that's God for you. In the worst of times, he will be, be favorable to you. And so I thank God today for that. And God, let me just pray and say thank you. You are awesome and lovely. And you love me. Thank you, Father God. You love us. You made us like this because you love us. Bad or for better or for worse, whatever the world thinks, it's not what you think. God's thoughts are not like our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. You know, you you um got some beauty queens out there and beauty kings now. Don't let's not forget. And then uh, you got some mediocre people. I'm one of the mediocre lookers. But I'm a dynamite person. I'm strong, courageous, and can be happy when I want to. And I'm a formidable enemy. And But I do love you. I love everybody. And then until they do something stupid to me, because I'm only carnal and I'm only human. But I've learned to forgive people and forget what they do. But it's not a matter of me still hanging around the same per persons who do the wrong things to me. I refuse to still be your friend. I refuse to keep company with you. I refuse to keep associating with you. I'm just, you know, nobody should put up with something that they don't have to. And I just don't. I'm just not the type. I'm telling you, I got enough troubles with the enemy trying to stay, keep be, drive a wedge between me and God. And I don't need human beings who are only human just like me, who have troubles just like I do, and problems and in, in, in turmoil in the world. Why would you want to destroy me when you got so much to focus on in your own life? You know, take care of your business and the outside realm of yourself will take care of itself. If you serve the Lord and you look constantly to the Lord for your help, for your protection, for your love, for your happiness, your joy, you'll get that. You'll find that in God. God is love. And that I, when when I say God is love, I learned that those are just, can just sound like words. Okay, God is love. But love is God. Love is what God is. Love is what God does. Love is who God is and what he means and what you mean to him. Love cannot exist without the Father God, and I thank God for that. And and I want all of us to try to get along with our fellow man and love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, the first two commandments and the ones Jesus stressed were to love the God, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit, and then love your neighbor as yourself. I find that hard for other people to do, but it's not for me. My love for my neighbor is to mind my own business. And keep to myself. Uh, that we don't live together, so we shouldn't have communication when we're all in our own homes. 
I don't want to talk to the neighbors downstairs or next door or, you know, in that way that God has given people to communicate without words. They, he's done it for animals, so, you know, people are higher than animals, so, of course, we can communicate through thought, fears, feelings, and spirit, you know, our spirit. We we all have a spirit, and it's a lovely thing, but I don't want to hear and be bothered with everybody all the time, every day, Man, and even if that sounds odd to you, it is still there. You can criticize it, and you can complain about it, but it's still there. And you know it. So let's all, you know, just accept that life is what it is. And God made humans to communicate without talking also, just as he did the animals. Animals understand each other. They know what to do. They know what to tell their their offspring and young to do without one word. And so can we. But people tend to use it in a negative way to discourage you, to get on your nerves, to bother you to be nasty, and, you know, whatever have you, and sometimes I'm just not in the mood, but hi, everybody, I'm in the mood for this now that I started talking about it, and I lost my spot God gave me at first, maybe I was talking too much, and these are the kinds of things I do in my spiritual life, and in my life relationship with God, if I see something that I'm not doing right, or see something that could be the cause of something else that's not good for me, I'm going to address it. I'm going to have courage, and I'm going to address it, and I'm going to tell God it's there, even when it's my fault, because it's always my fault, because it's me dealing with it, you know, it's my problem. So I don't have a problem telling God the bad things about myself, because guess what, everybody? He knows anyway. That's the tricky, that's the, not tricky, but the really kind of great thing about God. He knows every bad thing about us, every bad thought, Every bad behavior, every bad intention, yet he still loves us. There's no greater love than that. And another great love is that a man should lie, lay down his life for his friends, which Jesus Christ did, the Son of God, my Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who loves me that much to lay down his life for this wretched one that I live. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And thank you for you all, because through him I've learned to love you more than I ever did. I've always loved people. I've never set out throughout my lifetime to destroy other people or hurt them or bother them or be jealous and, you know, set a trap, form snares. And that's just not cool. And, you know, it, it doesn't make a beautiful person out of you, because it takes more time to lay a trap for another human being, your brother or your sister, then it does for you to love them and forgive them and care about them. It's just too easy to do. And I think a lot of my relationship with God, it stems upon the fact that that's the way I feel about life and, and others. You know, if I don't like you, I'm not going to be in your face or I'm not going to try to destroy you in any way. I'm not going to set a trap or a snare or get together with other people to to cause you harm or to stumble in life, I'm going to leave you alone. You know, you deserve to live free of my anger or jealousy or envy, wrath, hatred. You know, you deserve to live without that. Who needs it and who cares what, who should care whether or not I like them or not. Praise the holy name of the Lord. And I'm not going to spend all my time on talking about this kind of stuff, but that's the way I'm feeling today. And I'm just going to turn this with my Bible, my God's Word, to this page. Listen, this is Psalm 18, verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation in my high tower. I know that through downs, ups and downs in life, I haven't come through any of it, and I haven't been prosperous or fortunate without God. I have done nothing, even though it's taken me time to realize that even though I conducted my own life, I, it wasn't mine. I had no control over it, and I had no protection for myself, but God can protect me against millions of people 
then and then I can protect myself from. So that yes is my deliverer, my strength, my buckler, shield and buckler. You know, this is the King James version. Other versions say it differently, but if you look at Psalm 18 and 1 and keep going into you will see the alternative explanation for this these scriptures. And God is my salvation in my high tower. I can't be saved without God giving Jesus Christ to save me. Thank you, Father. Psalms 18, verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. It is so true. People have, like, ganged up against me to destroy me or make me conform to how they want me to be. I'm never what somebody else wants unless I decide to be. And I don't decide to be until I consult God and ask him, is it okay for me to try to change, you know, get along with somebody or, or uh, what do you call that? Be compatible with someone. Otherwise, you know, we ought to accept each other as we are, you know, for good and for bad. Now, we can always pray for one another, but we can't change one another. And But God can change us. And you need somebody to change your spouse, your children. You have to pray because nobody's going to do something exactly like you want it done or be exactly who you want them to be because you don't have that authority or power to uh, require that of somebody else. That that person is who God made. And here's another fact. God doesn't just love us. He likes us. He likes my personality. He likes your personality. He likes who you are. He made you that way. He wants you to be that person. He just doesn't want that evil part of it and the part of you that can be uh, uh, convinced or, you know, to do evil things or sin. He doesn't like that part of our personality, but he likes our personality. He made my personality the way it is, and he likes me this way. I've learned that through having a relationship with him, that he not only loves me, he likes who I am. And I will not only love him, I like who he is. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God we serve. Praise his holy name. Now I go on in Psalm 18 to verse 4. Uh, which I read already, but I'll read it again. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. It stopped me in my way. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and he and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. God listened to me through even through my sinful lifestyle. He heard me. There were so many times in my sinful days that I'm not gonna say sinful. I'll call it worldly. That I called upon the name of the Lord and He did answer me. God was proving to me that He loved me. He may not have loved my sin, and a lot of times we can go wrong misinterpreting that. We can think because God answers us and saved us out of some trouble that he doesn't mind us sinning, but he does mind us sinning. What God was trying to prove to me when he saved me in my worldly ways was that he loves me. I may be worldly, but he loves me. He was trying to show me that if he can love me then, what kind of love could he have for me when I give my life to him? And so, therefore, I know God is good. I know that God loves me, and I know that I'm safe in his arms once I have, since I have given my life to him through Christ Jesus. I've, I've committed my life to him. I've committed my way to him. I've committed my sinful nature to him to change and to transform me into somebody that can be accepted in his kingdom. God's kingdom is sinless, and I can't go there being having sin. Jesus Christ did die 
on the cross as our sin, but we can't continue on in sin at all, you know. There are some sins I have a hard time not committing, and there are some that's easy to drop and get rid of and not even perform. And those that are easy to not do, I will not do them. I haven't done them. I will not let people convince me to do them. But those that are hard for me to get rid of, I, I pray about because I want to be blameless and spotless before the Lord. I want to be acceptable in his eyesight. And as good as he is to me, I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to do as he pleases. I want to be what God wants me to be. And so, yes, I will pray to him about the things I can hardly control and that's hard for me, but the key to it all is to just tell them, to just tell God, admit it, confess it. God, I'm a sinner. God, I can't stop doing this. I can't, I can't seem to grab a hold or maintain distance from this here problem. You know, you really have to tell God everything about you. God, I'm afraid of that person. God, I don't want to I'm I'm afraid to talk to go outside because I'm afraid of that person and their vengeance and, and against me or you know their restitution or whatever you call it retaliation against me after that argument. I I can tell I tell God those kinds of things and I I did that in my worldly life you know when I I would tell God well hey God look I'm so scared Father can can you help me Father you know I'm scared of them. I won't admit it to nobody else, but I'll admit it to you. I'm afraid of that person. And God always eases. Oh, my God. He is good. He'll ease that fear for you and give you strength. And but and, and then nothing will happen. Nothing ha has ever happened to me when I told God I was scared of somebody and scared to pass that house or whatever, you know. God is good, man. Who do you have that can do that for you? Praise his holy name. Let me go on, you guys. And I wonder if we're going to turn the page, because this isn't really what I want to talk about. But here again is another scenario where it's not about me. God's got me on this page, and this is where I'll stay. Okay. Psalm 18, verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundation also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. That means God was angry. Woo! There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Oh my goodness. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea. He did fly up on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coal of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. And he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O God, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. That means God, when, uh, he can speak a word and things will happen. If God wishes it, wills it, or speaks it, it will come to pass. It will be done. Because God is that powerful. God is almighty. And I'll tell you, when you were thought of, that when God thought of you, you were destined to be. You were destined to be born. You were destined to live. You were destined to exist. Just because God thought of you, your personality, your person, you, whoever you are. My name's Carolyn. God thought of Carolyn way back sometimes. It could have been eons ago. We don't know how long God had plan to make the earth and me or you or our parents oh my god but when he thought of us we existed 
He didn't have to do anything more than think of us. Think of who he wanted here on Earth and why. And it was so. So, all down through the generations, all down since the beginning of time, I existed. I was destined to come into the world. You were destined to come into the world. You existed. You were God's thought long ago, afar off. Praise his name. You were a thought and you existed. Praise God. And I'm so glad you existed. Because without you, I would have nothing. Praise the Lord. I was going to get into a story about me. I had a thought about if I was the only person on earth, why would I want to be there? Why would I want to be by myself? You make the world. You make all of we, us, we make the world up. You make my world. Bad or good, you make it. When you're bad to me, I become stronger. When you're good to me, I become happier. And in return, I want to do the same for you. Make you happy, too. Praise God's name. Thank you, God, for thinking of us way back then. We belong here, and it is your will that we're here. Now, if we only would serve him and do his will while we're on this earth, he gave us purpose. Let's carry out our purpose so that God can be proud of us. And then when Jesus comes again, we don't have to live unhappy. We will never have tears again. We will never be hurt again. We will never have pain again. We will never see death again. And we will have life forevermore with the Father, which he meant to do from with us from the beginning until Adam and Eve decided they wanted to taste the forbidden fruit that God had told them not to touch in the Garden of Eden way back then. So we got to watch ourselves and try to our best and pray for the strength and the ability to be blameless and quit committing his sins that the Father don't, doesn't like us to commit. Okay, now Psalm 18 and then verse, uh, where was I? This will be verse Psalm 18, verse 16. He sent from above, he took me. He drew me out of many waters, a lot of out of many a lot of trouble, out of the devil's hands, out of the enemy's midst. He saved you. He drew you out of many waters that would drown you and kill you. And those waters are, you know, your enemies and your sins that are trying to kill you too. Psalm 18, 17. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They become so strong, your enemies, it's like, when they gang up on you, it's like, it, 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 even in the spiritual realm. They were ganging up on me and trying to trap me in this trap that I won't go in by the strength of Jesus Christ. I don't have to do myself harm or hurt myself because that's what they want. Why, the, in the first place, why do you want that? Why would you want pain and trouble and heartache for another person? Isn't it enough for you when you have it? Why do you insist or require other people to suffer and have pain? It's, it's unlikely, it's just unnecessary, it's so unhuman, it's so unbrotherly and, and extremely ungodly. Why would you want my hurt? That is something I'll never get, really. If you're in pain, why drag somebody else and make them cause them pain? Why can't you take care of your own pain? Why can't you pray? Read the Bible. Go to a therapist. Talk to somebody. Talk to yourself. And reason within yourself your purpose for wanting other pain for other people. Why can't you help yourself? This is the kind of thing I would like to know about the human nature. When a human suffers, this first impulse is to cause somebody else to suffer. How selfish can you be? How selfish is that? God does, it's not selfish. That is not something God loves. Jesus Christ was in much pain. 
He was scorched, beaten with a cat of nine tails, discouraged, his beard was pulled, he was spit on. They weaved a crown of thorns for the top of his head, which the thorns would prick his head, scalp, and make him bleed. But did he want that for you and me? No, he did not. Because that's not how you exist. That's not how you should behave to want to hurt the next person. You got to God. Pray to him. Get away from the pain. And then help somebody else in their pain. That's Jesus Christ, the Lord. That's him on the cross before he died. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You don't know what you don't when you hurt other people. That's so against what God's purpose for you is. You're nothing but a person yourself. Why are you trying to destroy somebody else? You know how that person feels. You know how it feels to be, you know, uh, discouraged and, 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 you know, victimized. You know how it feels. Why would you do it to the next person? This is something the good old Carolyn can't understand about other people. But thanks God for God, because he rescues me away from the hand of the enemy. Or the uh, or the enemies who gather up all everybody else who hates me and try to set a snare for me. I feel like their snare is that I conform to them for whatever reasons. I ain't giving you my life. I ain't giving nobody my soul. I'm not. I don't. Nobody owns me. I. I don't. I can't be owned or bought or sold or. You know, my soul is mine. God gave me. Why would I give it to you? Why would you require it? What can you do with it? Except drag me to hell with you. I don't want to go to hell. Understood? Thank you. Ain't going to hell. Jesus have saved me. And he says, listen to me. Jesus have saved me. And I ain't, I don't have to go to hell. And I'm not going with you. Because that's what you want. I'm, I'm going to abandon Jesus Christ and go to hell for you. Can somebody please tell me what kind of reasoning and sense that makes? Because it doesn't. And I wish the enemy would realize that and accept the fact that that doesn't make sense to me and I ain't doing it. How about that? Now, I go on in Psalm 18 and then, uh, Psalm 8, chapter 18 and verse 18. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. That means they stopped him and, 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 you know, put him down and helped his calamity be worse than what it was. And from it, or in the first place, that's the enemy, and that's what the enemy does. But the Lord was my stay. The Lord was my strength. The Lord pre prevented me also. He kept me still, and he he kept it from destroying me. He kept God kept me from being taken or giving in to them because the pain was so great. I don't want to give in to the enemy. I don't want to be with him. I don't want to do what he wants. And I can tell you now, I'd rather die. If death, if it would, if it was a choice between giving in to the enemy, who doesn't want one good thing from my soul, or dying, I'm going to take death because when I die, I'm going to be with God. So it's easy to, under, you know, let, you know, accept that better than, Hang on, please. The door. Hold on. I'll be right back.